This is going to be I Have Found Jesus in Genesis, part two. What we did last time was we started in Genesis chapter one and we just started looking for Jesus. That's what I did with my Bible. I turned to the first page. I started looking for Jesus Christ on every page. And as a review, we also talked about how Jesus himself said that he's in the Old Testament. If you look at Luke chapter 24 and verse 27, Jesus, it says, and, at, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So if he began at Moses, that's talking about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's what Moses wrote. And then you see where it says the prophets. That's Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. All the scripture that Jesus had was the Old Testament. And he's explaining, he's expounding to the disciples the things in the Old Testament that's actually talking about himself. So if he's doing that, then that shows Jesus Christ himself believed that he was in the Old Testament. John 5, 39, he says, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So if, if all the scripture he had was the Old Testament, and he is saying that they testify of him, then he knows the verses about him in the Old Testament. John five forty six through 47. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote of me. What did Moses write? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? So Jesus makes it clear that he's in the Old Testament. And as a review of what we talked about last time, in Genesis 1 through 2, it talks about the creation. And Jesus is the creator, as it plainly says in Colossians chapter 1. Plainly shows you in John chapter 1. And then in Genesis 3, you have Adam and Eve, which Adam and Eve will illustrate to you Jesus Christ and the bride of Christ. Eve was taken from Adam's rib. He, um, Adam wasn't deceived but ate the fruit because he loved his bride. Thorns and the curse on the ground. You saw that. That reminds you of the crown of thorns that Jesus wore and the curse that he took. So, with that being said, that was a quick review. Let's get into Genesis chapter 4. And in Genesis chapter 4, you're going to see the story of Cain and Abel. And the first similarity is, Abel and Jesus were both shepherds. In Genesis 4, 2, it says, And Abel was a keeper of sheep. And what did Jesus say in John 10 and verse 11? He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. So Jesus is a keeper of his sheep. Many people are worried about losing their salvation, but why would you be worried when Jesus is the keeper of the sheep? It says in Jude chap uh, chapter 1 and verse 24, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Jesus keeps you saved. You're not maintaining your salvation. Jesus Christ keeps you saved. He is the keeper of the sheep. And at the rapture, this shepherd, the chief shepherd shall appear and he's going to call the sheep home and we're going to know his voice. So just like Abel is a keeper of sheep, Jesus is also a keeper of sheep. Abel brought a blood sacrifice. Jesus Christ became a blood sacrifice. In Genesis 4.4 4, it says, And Abel... He also brought of the firstlings of his flock. 
So Abel did what he was supposed to do, and he brought a blood sacrifice. Cain, on the other hand, did not. But Genesis 4.4, 4, it says, And Abel, he also brought the firstlings of his flock. And then in Colossians 1.14, it says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. The sacrifice that Abel brought, that itself shows you Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. All the bloody animal sacrifices of the Old Testament point to Jesus Christ who is our perfect blood sacrifice that only had to be sacrificed once. Unlike the animal sacrifices you had to continually offer, animal sacrifices, Jesus only died for sins once. <clears throat> and as you know, Cain, Abel's brother, the evil brother, Cain, brought the fruit of the ground. And this picture someone trying to get saved by their own works. He's uh, worried about his fruit. He's worried about, is he does he have enough fruit to be saved, you see? You can see the similarities there. But if you could be saved by having good fruit, by living right. Galatians 2.21 says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Abel placed his faith in a blood sacrifice. Cain brought of the fruits of the ground. Do you today, do you have your faith in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ or is it in your fruit? The Bible makes it clear in verses like Romans 4, 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Plainly saying it's not of your works. Your works is the good things you do or the bad things you're abstaining from doing. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So, are you trusting in your fruit? Or are you trusting in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? But the Bible makes it clear. We're saved by faith without the deeds of the law. Next, you're going to see that both Abel and the Lord Jesus Christ were both killed because of envy. In Genesis 4, 8, it says, Cain rose up against Abel and slew his brother. And you know what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ? People were jealous of him. They envied him. And they slew him. In Mark 15, 9 through 10, it says, But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. People envied him, just like Cain envied Abel. Cain is said to be of that wicked one, and he was moved to murder Abel to corrupt the seed. You see, all through Genesis, it's about that promised seed that was promised in Genesis 3.15, and the devil is trying his best to corrupt the seed. He doesn't want Jesus Christ to be born. And that's why he moves Cain against Abel. Because Jesus Christ was going to come from that line, that, from Abel. But then, you know, Cain kills Abel. That pictures the Jews murdering Jesus Christ. But then Seth shows up. So Abel and his death picture the first coming. And Seth, who preserves the seed and doesn't get killed, pictures the second coming. Because the second time Jesus comes, he, they're not going to crucify him again. They're not going to kill him. Genesis 3.15, it says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So that's the Lord talking to the serpent there, he said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The devil, the serpent, doesn't want his head bruised, so he's going after that seed. 
He's trying to get rid of that seed. And that's why he moves Cain to murder Abel. But then Seth shows up. Who's going to preserve that seed? In Genesis 4.25 it says, Eve says, Hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel. So, there's Seth who pictures the second coming. When Jesus Christ is coming back, and they may try to crucify him again, but they're not going to be able to this time. The second time is better. Your second birth is better than your first birth. The first time you were born, you were born into this world to, to your mother, and then you were alive without the want law once, but then when sin revived, you died. You were dead in trespasses and sins when you realized you were a sinner. And that's when you needed that second birth. And the second birth is better than the first birth because that's when the second birth is when you were born into the family of God. And you'll notice that pattern is the second time seems to be better. You had Cain and Abel. You had Esau and then Jacob. You had Ishmael and then Isaac. The second one seems to be better. You had your first birth, then you had the new birth. But that's Cain and Abel and Seth. Now we're going to move to chapter 5, and you're going to see a very famous character show up named Noah, who has to build an ark. But Noah's name itself will remind you of Jesus Christ. His name means rest. In Genesis 5.29, you're introduced to Noah. It says, and he called his name Noah. And that name means rest. So, Matthew 11.28, Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And we talked about last time that Jesus is our Sabbath. He is our Sabbath rest. And we don't have to keep the Sabbath. Our Sabbath keeps us because Jesus keeps us. But the devil is once again trying to corrupt the seed. As you know, he has the sons of God marry the daughters of men. In Genesis 6, 2 through 4, it says, it says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. So, by the sons of God getting with the daughters of men and bearing children, this was to corrupt the seed. Somebody somewhere orchestrated this, and the devil was behind it wanting the seed corrupted because, you know, it produced giants. It, it was a corrupted seed. But there was a man, Noah. He, and he was pure from all this stuff. Genesis 6, 9, it says, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man. And look at this phrase, perfect in his generations, in his generations. So his, his line hadn't been corrupted by the sons of God and the daughters of men. And it says, and Noah walked with God. So you see, he's perfect in his generations. And he's going to be able to preserve the seed. Him and his three boys will be able to preserve that seed while all the rest of the world's been just, just ruined and ungodly. And they're going to have to die in the flood. But as you know, he has Noah build an ark. And the ark... It's not just Noah, but the ark itself shows you Jesus Christ. Remember that Jesus is the door. And there is only one door. He said in John 10, 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. And what does it say in Genesis 6, 16? There's only one door to that ark. It says, and the door of the ark there's only one way in there's only one way out there's only one way to get to heaven and that's the lord jesus christ it's only one way to get into the body of christ and that's by believing on the lord jesus christ 
Genesis 7, 1. The Lord says to Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. So Noah not only gets into the ark, which is a picture of believing on Jesus Christ, he also gets his whole house in there. His wife and his son and, and daughters-in-law. And that's what you need to do. When you believe the gospel, who's the first people you want to tell your family? You want to get them saved too. And it says in Acts 16, 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. If you've believed the gospel, why don't you tell your family the gospel? Come thou and all thy house into the ark. Enter that one door. Jesus is the door. No one could get in the ark and no one could get out of the ark. Because it says in Genesis 7, 16, And the Lord shut him in. As soon as he got on that ark, the Lord himself shut the door. And those giants couldn't get in. Uh, and they can't get out. So, what is that picture? It pictures your salvation. The moment you believe the gospel, you can't get unsaved. Because you're sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. The Lord seals you up. Ephesians 4.30, it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. It also says in Ephesians, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So you're sealed. Nothing can break the seal. Your salvation will never leave. You're eternally secure. And you know what else? It says in Genesis seven seventeen, And it was lift up above the earth. Just like Jesus is lift up, was lift up above the earth. You know that verse in John 3.14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So just like the ark was lifted up above the earth, the Bible plainly says that Jesus was going to be lifted up. And that's when he died on the cross for our sins. And even that verse, John 3.14, notice that gives you another Old Testament illustration of Jesus when it says the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness by Moses. Even so, the Son of Man must be lifted up. So you see, that's a whole nother illustration there. Just So Jesus died on the cross, became sin for us. And when we look to him, we are healed from the curse. We get salvation. Just like when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... And the people looked at the serpent on the pole. They were healed. That's a perfect picture of Jesus Christ. Another thing about the ark. The judgment touched the ark. Did you know the water? Which was the judgment of God. That's what touched the ark. But it didn't touch the ones inside the ark. The same way Jesus. When he was on the cross. He took the judgment of sin on the cross. So that it doesn't have to touch us. When Jesus Christ was on the cross, God took all of his judgment, all of his wrath on sin and poured it on Jesus Christ. All the judgment touched Jesus Christ. And if you're saved, that judgment isn't touching you. Jesus is our ark. He took, he took our sin. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 5.21 shows you plainly. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The Bible clearly says we're saved from wrath through him. It says we're not appointed unto wrath. Jesus Christ took the judgment. He took the wrath. In Genesis 7, 21, the Lord said, I will not again curse the ground. So since... Noah, he took that he took that bloody animal sacrifice and uh he appeased. He also that also appeased God's wrath. And as a result of Jesus Christ's death on the cross, the bloody sacrifice of that, the curse was lifted when you believed. So there's another similarity. 
But that's there's so many similarities between Jesus and the ark. That's just a few. This is just something to help you get interested in the Bible and dig for yourself. And we're just going to keep going with these. Keep doing finding Jesus in Genesis. And maybe we'll do finding Jesus in Exodus and all through the Old Testament. But this is something that will really help people get interested in the Old Testament. They think the Old Testament's outdated and that we just need to read the New Testament. Or they think the Bible itself is outdated. And when I'm going through all these and I'm looking for these on every page of my Bible, I'm using a red highlighter and I'm marking every time that I see Jesus red for the blood of Jesus, you know, through the Old Testament. And it blows my mind how the similarities are there between these Old Testament characters and Jesus Christ. And if it doesn't blow your mind, then you just really don't understand. Because, I mean, this was thousands of years before Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Yet, he's all through the Old Testament. And my pastor always says, you can find Jesus on every page. So I just started in the first page and just started marking every time I found him. That'll really help you get interested in the Bible. It'll help you want to read the Bible. It makes the scriptures come alive. Because, you know, a lot of people like to look at books with pictures. They like it illustrated. And that's what the Bible is. It, when you look at it, it may just look like black words on white paper. But it's actually a picture book. And you can see a picture of Jesus Christ on every page. That'll make you more interested in the Bible. All those pictures, all the way throughout the Old Testament. 